Sheila are on vacation, so we're going to wish them well and they get some rest after the heart attack at gas prices as they're going. But um, our call to worship today comes from Psalm 11, verses 1 to 4. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows and they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows in the upright heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on the earth and his eyes examine them. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for a time that we can come worship together as your children. We just pray that you will, your hand will be in this service. This service is yours. Help us to focus on you and to hear what you would have us to hear. And we just pray that you will just bless Pastor Tom and Sheila on their trip. Amen. You will stand with us.
So be thinking about how you're going to honor your father. June 26th through 30th is uh, Zoomerang um, for VBS. If you would like a VBS shirt, I need you to sign the sheet today because I need to get those ordered. And I think we got most of the help, but you're still welcome to come hang out with the kids yeah. and uh, build relationships. Um, camps at Shiloh Park. Um, and for rookie camp, which is the one I direct, we possibly have seven or eight kids going. Um, so I could use a counselor because for every seven kids we bring, we're supposed to be bringing a counselor. So if there's anybody who would love to come spend a few days with first, second, and third graders, guys I need the most because I always end up running out, uh, not having enough. So if you want to come and just make an impact, and I will tell you, being a counselor at camp is just as rewarding as being a kid going to camp because you have a lasting impact on those kids. I still have a relationship with the very first counselor I had in first grade. And um, so you build relationships. So if you're interested, please let me know. And September 16th to the 18th is our 100 year celebration. Tina, do you have anything to add for that at this point? We might have a visitor next week telling us a little bit more about it. Okay. Um, Tyra did pass out papers today, and if you would tell Facebook people to let us know if they want, get us that information, we'll get that information to them, we'll get their pictures, Yes. And get it in the book. Yes, um, we're working on getting a new directory, which has been a long time since we've done one. So Tyra has some forms for those of you who are here. If you are not here, um, you can put a message on there and then somebody can get back to you on what information uh, we would like to have. Um, just so we can, and then we're going to get pictures. So if you have a family picture you'd like to bring, otherwise they will be taking pictures to be able to put in our directory. So. It's been like eight years, I think, since we've um, done one, so that is um, exciting. So. Next week, it will be somebody from 100 years ago that will be showing up. Okay, so you've got to come back next week to see the surprise visitor for next week. Okay, so it's um, time for our tithes and offerings. Thank you um, for your giving, and we can't outgive God, can we? And um, if you'd like to give online, you can go to dunkirknazarene.org, or you can... Do it today, and I need a couple ushers if um, Bob and Tanner can come help with that. And, um, and you can, so let's just give to God what he deserves. And we'll have a quick prayer here. All right, dear Lord, again, we just thank you for all your blessings. And Lord, you give us so much, and we don't deserve any of it, but yet you continue to give. Take the gift and the give and bless it and bless the gift and the giver and just use it for the furtherance of your kingdom in your precious name. Amen.
Megan in our prayers. She's not feeling real well this morning, and we want to keep the family in Mount Pillar, um, who lost the great grandpa and the grandson, and there's two family members still fighting for their lives. We want to keep them in our prayers as well. The altar is open. If you have anything you want to come pray about, come on down and pray.
a tragedy. But you are still God, even in the hard times. In fact, in hard times, you're usually more God to us and you're closer to us and you draw us closer. And I just pray that you would just touch this family and this community. Just heal them. Bring comfort and peace as only you can. And we just, again, just praise you for being the God that you are, a God of truth and a God of love and a God of honor. And you are holy. And we worship you today. Just to pray again for Pastor Tom and Sheila that you'll give them a time of rest and traveling mercies and bring them back safely. And we just pray that, Lord, this service is yours. Hide me behind the cross and speak. Help me to speak the words that you've given me to speak. And be with our children as they go to Children's Church with Kim. And just bless each one of us. In your precious name, amen. And you may be seated. And children, you can go on to Children's Church with Kim. Well, I hope you all had a great week, and and uh, the weather's been gorgeous the last few days. And this morning, um, God has given me uh, a message that's on my heart for God's blueprint for our home. And but but first, I have um, I need uh, my two volunteers to come up. I wanted to show you something and put something in perspective that uh, really put it in perspective for me. If you would hold that end. And if you will hold this end. This rope is 14 feet long. And each inch counts for one hour in a week. This little piece right here shows that this is what we as a church, the time we have with our kids and or youth to teach them about God. One hour a week is our average. When you look at this, that's not much. And one of our children's pastors on our district, Eric Ward's the one who showed us this, and he said this means we got to make this count. But on the flip side of that, parents, the church can't disciple your children do all the discipleship. We only have this time. The rest of the time, the children are yours at home. So parents are the ones that need to do the majority of the teaching because we can't teach in this little time everything kids need to know about Jesus. Thank you. When I saw that, I thought, wow. I was encouraged in a lot of ways, but then also, again, man, i got to get myself on the stick on what I'm doing. So... We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. But first, we have a picture, couple of pictures of blueprints. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had a home built or not. But when you build a home, you start with a blueprint, right? You can't just all of a sudden show up with stuff and, okay, we're going to pile this on. So there's a couple different pictures of blueprints. And God's given us a blueprint for our home. And you can't build a house from the roof down, right? You can't build it from the sides and not have the top and the bottom. You always have to start with the foundation. So if the plans are... The, and what happens if you don't follow these blueprint plans? The house isn't going to be what it needs to be, is it? Something's going to fall. Something's not going to work. Something's not going to function right. And sometimes once you've built a house, you have to clean it out and get rid of junk. How many of you uh, clean out parts of your house, do spring cleaning? And I do spring, I do about once a quarter, it feels like, <laughs> to get rid of stuff that you don't have. It's amazing how you can accumulate stuff that you don't need. Well, spiritually, we have a home as well. And we need a good foundation and we need a blueprint on how our home is supposed to be run. So that's what we're going to talk about today. God's blueprint for our home. And this is not just for parents. 
um, with kids at home. Those of you who are empty, in empty nesters and still have grandkids, this is for you too. Because there's actually a verse that I will read in a few minutes that talk about that. That parents are commanded and grandparents are commanded to teach their children. Today I want to f focus on the beginning of a home and the foundation and the instructions for a home. And in a couple weeks, we're going to go through the whole house. And we're going to go to different rooms and talk about what God's plan was. But as we talk about foundation, there are only two spiritual foundations and worldviews. God's Word and man's Word. And if it's not in the Bible, then it's man's Word. It's not God's Word. So we're going to look at some scriptures... But first, we're going to go back to Genesis and look what, at what God designed the family to be. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created mankind in his, own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruit, fruitful and increase the in number. Fill the earth, earth and subdue it. And then Genesis 2.20 says, so the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed it up with flesh. And then the Lord God made woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man. He brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. This is God's design for marriage and family. One man, one woman, and children. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, which is where we're going to be focused on, Hear, O Israel. When God says hear or behold, that means you better pay attention to what he says. The Lord your God is... The Lord our God is... The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and your gates. And grandparents, you're not left out of this because verse also says, All, only be careful to watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget these things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart. Teach them to your children and your children after them. So this is the only place in the Bible where God commands anybody else besides parents to teach and disciple their children is when he talks about the grandparents. And that is, I heard from a speaker um, at a convention I was just at a couple weeks ago. Uh, Israel Wayne talked about that. It's the only place. The church actually isn't commanded to teach children or youth. We are there to support the parents. It's up to the parents to do the job. So what all does this mean and how do we do it? How do we build a foundation on Jesus? Well, first of all, Jesus has to be the foundation and the number one priority in your home. Jesus is the only firm foundation. So parents, we have to have Jesus as our foundation personally before we can pass it on to our children. We can't give to them what we don't have. So we have to have a good, solid relationship with Jesus first before that. So our relationship has to be a number one priority. Children need to see us physically spending time in the Word. They need to see us praying. They need to see us putting other people above ourselves. And they need to see us put our spouse second only to God. So they need to see us, you know, hug and kiss our spouse before they go to work and, and see us greet them when they come home. They need to see us respecting each other. Now, granted, that doesn't mean we all agree. Has any, does anybody who's been married, you agree with your spouse on every single thing? No. If you say yes, you're lying because <laughs> there are no two people who are agree going to agree on anything. But there is a way to still show respect to your spouse in front of your children or grandchildren, even when you disagree. And that's what kids need to be seeing from us. And everything we do has to be based on God's Word. Do you know that the average Christian today spends five minutes a day in the Bible... 
Five minutes a day. We can't know God's word in that short time. And according to the book Indoctrination, parents spend 30 minutes a week talking about spiritual things. 30 minutes a week. That's even less than what some of us Sunday school teachers and do. We cannot know the Bible. We cannot know God in his heart in that short amount of time. Now, granted, we know when kids are younger, you don't have as much time as you do when, you know, may not be able to do, do an hour a day. And that's fine. But we need to be doing something. And when we spend our time in God's Word, we need to be sitting down doing it with our children. Our kid, I, I do that for, since I homeschool. I'm able to do a lot on the Bible. And I'm able to sit down with my girls and teach them as much as we can. But we've got to take the time to do it. We got to say, okay, let's turn off the TV. Let's go sit down and let's go read a, a passage of scripture and let's talk about it. We need to spend time sitting down and doing dinners and things and sitting down and visiting and talking with our children. And when we're out places, when we're out, you know, shopping or out just driving, talk to the kids about the trees and the grass and all the animals and the birds and the things that we see. That's what it is. And it took God a little while to get this drilled into my head as to what that exactly meant. But our kids see more than we give them credit for. And you know what? They're going to follow what we do, not always what we say. And I don't know how many of you have ever had your child say something back to you and you're like, where did you get that from? Well, from you, Mom. And you're like, oops. You know, I mean, we all do. We all have those moments and those times when we lose it. I remember one time when the girls were little and they were fighting in the car and I screamed and I was like, will you two quit screaming at each other? And I pulled over the side of the road and I just started crying. I thought, man, I'm telling them to stop doing what I just did. And I thought, that's not the example that I want to set. Psalm 127, 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house... The builders labor in vain, unless the Lord watches over the city, and the guards stand watch in vain. So God and his word has to be our number one foundation for everything we do. And every decision we make as parents or grandparents, every decision we make, we have to take it to the scripture and say, does this match up with what God's word says? If it doesn't, you don't do it. Or if it does, then you do it. So this is telling us we can't build a good home without God. God has to be there, to, and he is our teacher. He is our instructor, and the Bible is our instruction book. I hear people all the time, well, kids don't come with instructions. Yes, they do. The Bible is our instruction book. Now, it doesn't go into every single detail, you know, on things, but it is the foundation. It's the base for everything that we, that we do in our home. Now, God's design for the family is to be one man and one woman married for life. And in our fallen world, that doesn't always happen. And there are single moms, there's widowed parents, there's divorced parents, but you know what? God can still and should still be your foundation of your home. And God will fill in the gaps for where, what things are missing in cases like that if we let him to do that. The second thing is we need to use the tools, the right tools that we were given. God's very word is very clear on marriage, family, and the home, and we read it in our own personal time, but also as a family. When I was growing up, we had family devotions and prayer every night, and I didn't appreciate it as a kid. I hated to go sit and listen to my mom read all this stuff, but I am so grateful for it now because there are times when I can go back and I can think of a scripture that mom had read or something that we had specifically prayed for, or a prayer that was answered that I can remember growing up as a kid. And it doesn't have to take, you know, you don't have to spend an hour standing there singing, you know, four hymns, but just take 10, 15 minutes every day and read the Bible to your children to spend that time with, and allow them to ask questions, because that's the only way they're going to learn also. And, um, and when kids see us and they hear us praying for them and for others, it shows them that we love them. I don't know how many of you, I, I try to pray over my girls every night before they go to bed. And there's times when I've just felt God's spirit say, just go pray longer or go pray this for them. And I will go in and bow and pray for them. And can you imagine how, how precious that is to them 
for them to know you love them enough to spend that time in praying for them. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie of War Room, but there's a scene in there when um, he finds out that his wife had been praying for him all that time, and his friend said, man, I wish my wife would pray like that for me. That's what our kids need. They need us to pray for them and to pray hard. God gives each of us talents and abilities, and we can use them to help our kids and grandkids. God created each husband to be with his wife and for the parents to be with the children they have. So the children you have or the grandchildren you have, God specifically designed you for them and them for you. And that sometimes really is, makes me in awe that, because there's days, you know, I feel like the worst failing mother. I don't know any of us who haven't had moments like that. But then God says to me, I designed these kids for you. You are the best mom for them or the best grandma and the, or the best dad, whatever the case is. And we need to remember that, that God, he's not going to give us our kids and say, okay, here you go, you're all on your own. He is there with us to guide and take us each step by step every day as to what we need to do to help them. And that makes the kids feel special as well, that they were designed specifically for us. Psalm 1 2 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but those who delight in the law of the Lord and they who meditated on it day and night. So this tells us as parents that we need to delight in God's word and med meditate on it. And, when it and this means we're also to avoid other things, worldly pleasures and things that do not line up with God's word. I looked up the word mockery in that verse, and it says to treat with contempt or ridicule, to disappoint the hopes of, and defy or challenge. And I don't know how many of you have noticed how many things in this world defy and challenge and go against God's word. We have to have discernment. And discernment is, I always thought it was learning right from, left, or from, right from wrong, but actually it's not. Discernment is learning from what's right and what's almost right. And when I thought about that, I thought there are so many things that look so good sometimes and they look like they're going to be okay. And then when you take a deeper look, no, this isn't exactly what I thought it was. So we have to, as parents, we have to have discernment. Our children don't have discernment yet. They're learning as we go. But we have to teach them how to have discernment. So when we're looking... I know there's, uh, my girls have come to me at, sometimes on TV shows and I know I'm not going to let them watch and they'll come, Mom, can you come change the channel? Now they can do it themselves, but before they were, you know, couldn't do it. So they would come to me and they knew they weren't supposed to watch whatever TV show it was. We have to teach them to have that discernment, to know what's right and wrong. And the only way you're going to know that is by what the Bible says. And those who at work in the bank... They don't show them all the kinds of counterfeit money so they know what to look for. They show them what the, right, the real money is, the real stuff, so that they see anything that doesn't look like this, we don't want it. That's the same with God's Word. So the only way we're going to know what goes against God's Word is to know God's Word. We see that happening today. And Satan is using people, he's using events, he's using... The world, he's using all sorts of things to tempt us and, and us as parents and grandparents to just let our kids do whatever. But we can't do that. Luke 6.40 says, A student is not above his teacher, and when he's fully trained, he will be like his teacher. So, my question is, who's teaching us? Or who's teaching our children? Are we doing it? It should be Jesus and his word. And we have to really pay attention. Who's influencing our children? What is influencing our children? We as parents are responsible for what's being taught. I don't care who's doing the teaching. We are the ones that are responsible. We're the ones that are going to be held accountable when we get to heaven someday. And I want to know that I've done everything I could possibly do to teach my children the right things. We can't protect them from everything. Absolutely, and there's no way you can protect children. And I don't know if I'm not the only mom who at some point has wanted to protect my kids from everything. We can't. But we can, and we are commanded to control what comes into our house and where our children go and who they spend time with 
or our grandkids in a lot of cases because there are a lot of grandparents that are taking care of kids nowadays. We control what they watch, what they listen to, and all of those things, and teach them the right things to look for, then gradually let them start making decisions. According to a study that was done by the Barna Group in 2020 or 2010, 32 percent of baby boomers went to church on a regular basis. And in 2018, it was down 21 percent. Down to 21 percent. That same study showed 18 percent of millennials went to church in 2010. And now in 2018, it's down to 11 percent of millennials. Why? Well, because our society and even our church in some cases are not always telling the truth. Everybody has your truth and my truth. Your opinion, my opinion. Your thoughts, my thoughts. That, none of that matters. All that matters is what God's Word says. And we have to stand on the Bible, biblical foundation. We have to believe that God's Word is true, the whole thing. We can't take out bits and pieces and parts that we want and parts that we don't like. We have to live by the whole thing. We need to compare everything we say, do, read, scripture, whatever, to scripture. 70 to 88 percent of kids nowadays are leaving the church by the time they are freshmen in college. 70 to 88 percent. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will, because those are the kids that are going to be our leaders in doing everything around in 10, 10 years, or less, actually, in some cases. Why are they leaving the church? Well, to be quite honest, they have, some of them have not been raised with the right foundation. I mean, even when you do raise your kids for the foundation, there's no guarantee that they are going to follow Christ. But it's a whole lot better percentage-wise if we, they know they have the foundation. But even the church has compromised the foundation of God's Word. Even Christians, there's a lot of pastors don't even know the Bible. Because nobody wants to take the time and they don't want to offend and they just they want to keep going. But we cannot lose the foundation of God's Word. It has to be taught from generation to generation to generation. No matter what the culture says or the government or people or even the church, our opinions don't matter. Jesus offended people when he was here, but he always spoke the truth and he always spoke it in love. And he always forgave. But when he forgave, like the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, all these different things, he always said, go and sin no more. So we have to make sure that we are standing totally on the foundation of God's word. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. 2 Timothy 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible should be our teacher. And Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Parenting and grandparenting is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's going to take a while to see the harvest. And I know all of us as, as parents have had those moments when you feel like, oh, my land, you're never going to get there. These kids are driving me crazy. We always have those moments. But Heidi St. John says that a person would not go to the grower of an apple orchard and ask them, where's your apples, when it's a tree, apple tree sapling that's not ready to grow. The, the apples haven't grown yet. We have to keep planting the seeds for our kids and our grandkids from God's word, and God will harvest them in his time. And we don't see everything from when our kids are little. We're not going to see everything of the harvest that we've sown. Of all, we're not going to reap everything that we've sown right away. But it will come. And you will get snippets. I see snippets of my girls now, little bits at a time. Abby got up in the restaurant the other day and just went and held the door open for an, an older, two older ladies leaving. One of them came and said, they're being taught right. And I thought, well, thank you, but I, I don't do it for that reason. But you will see those seeds starting to reap and starting to grow and harvest. But it takes time. So until then, we just keep planting the seed. We keep working at it. We keep praying. We keep praying. We keep praying. And God will harvest those seeds in his time. The third thing is that we got to clean house sometimes to build a godly home. Sometimes that means we get rid of physical items you don't need anymore and you organize what you have. 
and you get things back to normal so you can actually function better. And I know that cleaning out the house, it feels good to me. I don't know how the rest of you feel when you get all done and you look at, we cleaned out our shed yesterday, and after we pulled everything out, we thought, how in the world did we get all this in there to start with? So we filled up our dumpster, we reorganized some things, we're going to sell some stuff, and then we got done, we were tired, we were sore, but it felt good that we got this all cleaned out. When we have those material things in the world, and we can have everything that God, that the world has for us, we can have the biggest house, the best car, all of that, and still have a dysfunctional family. Because we, this doesn't mean when you have to sell everything to the poor, and you have to just, you know, think about where your focus lies. But we have to think about what we have. We don't have to have the latest toys and the latest everything. And it's so tempting. But are we focused on giving our kids and our grandkids Jesus? Because you know what? When they go to heaven or when they die, none of that's going with them. Right? Everything is staying here. I love the story I heard about one that said they were supposed to pay somebody that had passed away. Said, well, we'll write them a check and stuck the check in with the casket. <laughs> so they paid them back. But they're not, money's not going anywhere. They're not taking it. The only thing they can, they're going to take to eternity is either taking Jesus with them and going, or they're not. There's no other, other options. So cleaning out our home... To, to focus on Christ is the most important thing we can do. Cleaning out our calendar might be one thing. How many of you feel like you're too busy? I uh, know I can't be the only one. The days that feels like it. You know, we have to, sometimes we need to say no to things. Especially when they don't help us grow in Jesus. And, and even when, they, when we're doing good things for God, we can still miss God and the fact that we're doing too many things at the same time. We have to make sure that whatever we're doing is focused on where Christ wants us to be. And I know that that's happened to me before when I left one church, I left 10 jobs and how I got to 10 jobs, I don't know. But we are showing our kids what's important in our life by our actions, not by what we say. We can say, okay, you need to go to church and you need to do this and you need to do that. But if we're not doing it, the kids aren't going to do it. They're going to follow whatever we're doing. So that means if we tell our kids church and being with our church family and doing something for God is number one, then that means you don't skip church to go shopping, go to games, or go do whatever. We, we spend the time that we're supposed to here with, with God here at, because we need each other. I don't know how the rest of you are, but I need to see my, my church family. I need to spend time with them. That's how we grow. And if we are not taking that time to do that, then we're missing out. And our actions speak louder than our words. And busy stands for being under Satan's yoke. I think that is busyness. I think is Satan's number one of his top tactics is to get families so busy doing everything that they don't spend time together, they don't eat meals together, they don't do anything. I mean... Some kids, they get home from school, they go to ball practice here, they go to choir practice there, they go to gymnastics or whatever, they get home, eat a 20-minute dinner, bath time in bed. Well, how is that a quality relationship time? How is that building relationships? It's not. But that's what Satan wants, because if he can keep us busy and keep spouses busy and so they don't pay attention to each other, then he's got room to start throwing his darts in and attacking in our families. And those of you who don't have kids living at home or your kids don't live here, adopt one of the kids in the church to be their grandma or to be their mom or aunt because there are a lot of kids here that do not have parents who care and who are not doing this. So then that's when the church steps in and helps to cover that. Spiritually, we have to do the same thing. We have to clean out our hearts out of anger, frustration, jealousy, selfishness, whatever the bad attitudes are. And then once we do that, we get everything cleaned out, God fills us, and then we're prepared to do the work that God has called us to do. And it's good for kids to see us doing things for God. It's good to involve them in doing things for God and to be that servant. So are we teaching our children also that good works come out of our love for God? You don't do good works and earn God's love and salvation. That, that's a free gift to us. But once we have that, 
then all of the love that we have for God, all the works come out with helping with whatever it is God has asked us to do. And we need to get rid of our homes of filth. And that can mean different things for people. Maybe it's music, maybe it's language, books, magazines, TV shows, games, violence, whatever it is. Every family is going to have a different issue. But whatever that filth is, we've got to get rid of it because that cannot go with the foundation that we have. And God will help us to do that. I remember about six months before Kevin and I met, and I just kept praying. I kept, you know, I was just really feeling bad. And um, the guy that I had been dating had dumped me, had just had not even shown up for our last date, and I haven't heard a word from him since. And it was, it was, I was just a really down time. I mean, it was bad. I was like, God, what in the world are you doing? And you know what God said to me? He's like, your heart is not ready to accept who I have for you yet. You got too many things in there on this. And I had read this book called um, Authentic Beauty. And the author is Leslie Ludy, and she writes in there that she had this dream of her wedding and she was on the beach and they were in this cabin on the beach and her husband had just carried her across the threshold and all of a sudden she gets into there and she had one old boyfriend in the corner, she had a bag of trash over here, spaghetti sauce got in her dress and her groom runs out. And I thought, what in the world? That's not a very good story. But she said the point was that's how God feels when our heart sanctuary is full of everything else except Him. And after I read that book, and, I, and she wrote, she went into her room and closed her door and said, okay, God, what do I need to fix? Pretty vulnerable to ask God that question. And I essentially did the same thing. And God said to me, okay, you need to get rid of this video. You need to get rid of this. There was nothing drastically, I mean, it wasn't like real, real bad, but it was bad enough that it was keeping me from getting in that full relationship with God. So I got rid of everything. I mean, I shredded stuff. My, I'm sure the trash guy wondered what in the world I had been doing. Shredding all this and getting rid of this. And then everything that that last boyfriend had given me, I threw it all out and I sent some of the stuff back to his mother. And after that, six months later, I met Kevin. It was God saying to me that he had to be the king on my heart sanctuary before I was ready to do anything else. And that's what we have to do as individuals, but then we have to do it as a family. We have to then sit down together and say, God is going to be Lord of this home. Regardless, God is going to be number one. And sometimes I've even gone and, you know, when you feel Satan really coming at you sometimes, I've gone through my house and I have just kicked him out. I've literally, just like they did in the, in the War Room movie, I know some people didn't like that scene. They thought she was talking to Satan. I thought, well, what? She's kicking him out of her house. So I've gone through the house before and said, God, kick, get into Satan out of here. He's not welcome here. And I remember one day, Abby was probably about four, and we had just had one of those really bad mornings. Everybody was mad. We were hollering, screaming. It was just a mess. And I was stood in the bathroom. I stood in the hallway, and I was praying. I said, Satan, get out of here. This is not your home. Well, then a little while later, Abby got upset about something. She went back to that exact same spot, and she said, Satan, get out. Mom's already kicked you out of here. And I thought, you know what? Sometimes you physically have to do that. You physically have to speak it out. But if we don't clean out the filth, there's not room for the good stuff that God has for us to come in. We have to get it all cleaned out. And whatever that entails for you, for your family, and then you fill it up. You put on praise music. You watch good, clean entertainment, which is hard to find nowadays. You find good books, and then you just, you as a whole family, pray in the morning when you get up that you will all have the attitude of Christ throughout the day. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, I have the right thing to do, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So there are some things that are okay. I mean, God doesn't say they're specifically sins, but they're also not beneficial. Everything isn't always beneficial to you. Um, if you are one who, you know, if you've been a, um, if you have a sweet tooth like me, it's not beneficial for me to always go into a bakery, <laughs> right? Because that's where I'm going to want to buy it, although I still do sometimes. But, but that's, you know, it's not, it's not a sin for me to have a cupcake, but it's also not always the best thing for us either. So we have to look at things that we are doing in our homes and think, okay, 
it's okay, it's not really sin, but it's not beneficial, let's, let's get rid of it, or let's quit watching, or quit doing, whatever that case is. We need to have actions that show love, so we need to respond with love and grace to our children. Are we going to mess up and yell at our kids and spouse at times? Yep, we are, because we're all human. But the best part is, all we have to do is ask Jesus for forgiveness. He will do that. We go to that person, whether it be our kids or our spouse, and ask for forgiveness, and they will forgive us too. And you know what? Kids are the most loving, forgiving people. I don't know how many times I feel like I've, I'm like, girls, I've come to you four times today and had to ask for forgiveness for something, you know, on some of those hard days. But you know what? They said to me, Mom will always forgive you because I've told them the same thing. I will always forgive them. And that's what relations, family relationships are all about. Each day is a fresh start, just like every day with God's a fresh start. He's forgotten the mistakes we made yesterday. We start fresh today, and we're going to just go on, and God will help us each step of the way. Matthew 7, 25 says, The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. And Luke 6, 49 says, But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built the house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So this is telling us that we have to have God as the foundation, and God's foundation will hold us. That does not mean we're not going to sway, and we're not going to have those days where we've got broken windows in our home or whatever in our, in our spiritual home, but we will stand as long as we're standing on the solid rock of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 11 says, For by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else who is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And in Proverbs 14, 1 says, The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears it down. So we as parents, we have to, to really think about what our foundation is. Do we have a strong relationship with Christ? Do, are we teaching that to our children? Are we living it out? Is, God's word, is our foundation God's word or is it man's word? And, you know, you hear about all these talks of all these different religions out there. There's actually those two. It's either God's religion or it's man's religion. There's, there isn't any other choice. And we want to make sure that we are standing on that foundation. There's a couple of pictures of houses who have lost their foundation. And they're falling down. That's what happens to us if we don't stay on the foundation of, of Christ. So my, and in a couple weeks, we're going to look at each room in the house and see what God intended for each of the rooms. But my challenge to you today is for you to look at your relationship first, your relationship with Christ. Is it where it needs to be? And then your relationship with your spouse. Because you know what? If, if Satan can destroy marriage... He's got a clean shot at the kids. And that's what he's working on. He's trying to destroy marriages so that he can get right to those kids. So we have to have a strong marriage too. And then look at your foundation of your home. Does it need started? Does it need strengthened? Or does it need remodeled? Does your foundation need to come in and be... Does God need to come in and do some cleaning? Does he need to come in and get things right and stepped up to where they should be. And grandparents, I know some of you have you know kids that come over, but your home needs to be this way for when your grandkids come visit. They need to come to the grandpa and grandma's house and be able to be free and see grandpa and grandma treating each other right, grandpa and grandma teaching them, reading them Bible stories, teaching them the same thing. And if you don't have that situation, or if you don't have grandkids here, or you're not a mom, then take up one of the kids we have here or somebody in your family and be that role to them. Because Lord knows that most of the kids out there do not have parents that are doing this the way God intended. So we have to just step up and do some of that for them. We're going to close with a song. And I invite you, if you feel like your foundation needs work, 
or you want to pray for somebody else's foundation, come pray for them. There's nothing more than Satan wants to destroy us. And if he can destroy us, then he's, then he's got his way. But we're not going to give him a chance. And if you need to come down and kick him out of your house, come down and kick him out of your house. I mean, it is worth it. It is worth all the work. There's nothing that's worthwhile that's not going to take work. And parenting, grandparenting, and marriage are all three take work. But every bit of it is worth it. And it will be worth it when we see all of our family in heaven someday. So if you will stand with me. And if there's something God's speaking to you about, just meet him down here. There's something special about coming and bowing before him. that you are the solid rock and you are the foundation we can and need to build our lives upon. We just thank you for that. And Lord, we just again pray for all the situations going on in our community and just be with each person here today and with all those that are watching online and just help us to just focus and build our relationship with you so that we can be the witness and the example we need to be for others. Bring us all back together again tonight, and we just thank you and praise you for everything. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>